أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين حبيب الله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أستق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful. It's due to that kindness and mercy that we have these opportunities where we gather in remembrance and glorification of Him, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. I pray that all of you are well, inshallah, and that you are healthy. What I wanted to talk about today, you know, is um, one of the, the highly recommended acts of worship that we can do in this great month of Sha'ban uh, is to recite the Munajat of Sha'baniyyah. Um, this is a very beautiful munajat. We can call it a dua, but it's called a munajat, right? A munajat comes from the word najwa. It's a very private and secret conversation that one has with another. So for example, if, if two people are seated and they're whispering to each other, if they're talking good, this is a munajat. You know, Allah mentions this in the Holy Quran that He doesn't like certain types of najwa, right? When He doesn't like where people gossip and talk about others, especially when others are around to have a whispered conversation is very bad akhlaq, you know, because imagine if two people are seated and the rest and they're busy whispering, the mind begins to think negative that they're talking about me maybe, you know, and so Allah doesn't like when hearts are put in a situation and this is things that we have to learn, that when we conduct ourselves as human beings, our actions are not just limited to us, but rather how are our actions perceived by others. This is part and parcel of akhlaq, and that's something that we always have to take into consideration. Here, the munajat that we're talking about is a secret or a silent whispered prayer. It's a prayer or it's a conversation that one has with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they feel very connected to God, very close to God. Um, where you have certain things you want to get off your chest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's a very beautiful way. This, the time of munajat can be any, but of course the best times for munajat to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is late at night, you know, when everyone is asleep and it's just you and God and you speak to Him. It's very powerful. It can have tremendous impact and, and effects in our lives. This munajat of Sha'baniya is taught to us by Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. And it's a munajat that he recited, and according to the traditions, it is a munajat that is, or that was recited by every other Imam that came after him. And hence, it's a munajat that we should recite because it would make us follow that sunnah of the Ahlul Bayt, something that we know that they have done, we do as well. And as I said, it's a very powerful prayer. Um, I, really pr I really hope that you've already read it one time in this holy month. And if you, hadn't, if you haven't, then do so. But try and find a time when you are not occupied when you don't have something else pending. You know, when we have something else pending, then we never put in much concentration or much heart into that. But when you have some free time and there's nothing else going on, read this munajat. It's extremely, extremely beautiful. It's really beautiful. It's, I, can't, I don't think I can describe it any other way. It's very beautiful. And I think that 
I don't know, every time I read this munajat, I feel like Imam wrote it knowing my life history. I kid you not, yeah? It's like he, he knew me and he's talking to God about me. And so when I'm speaking to God, it's like, man, how does the Imam know my life? Yeah? And that's how we connect. But that's human beings. All of us are like that, right? Many times we feel that we are alone in this journey. We're not alone. Yeah? This journey has been walked on by many. And the troubles of this world have been experienced by many. Um, you know, a simple thing I always tell, especially youngsters, is that sometimes, you know, youngsters feel that they're the only ones going through hardship, hard difficulty. I was like, have you ever Googled something? And before you can even finish the sentence, Google finishes it for you. Why? Because millions of others have asked the same question. Yeah? In the same way, when we experience something, man, millions of others have experienced it. We learn from them, we take recourse in that, and that helps us. This is a form of psychology, isn't it? Where Allah does not put us into something, number one, more than we can handle, but as well, He does not put us into something that others have not gone through. This is why even when we talk about the verse of fasting, right? Kutiba alaykumu siyam kama kutiba ala min qablikum That fasting has been prescribed for you the way it was prescribed for others. To say like, yeah, you don't feel bad. Others did it too, right? So like you just add on to what others have done. And so this munajat, as I said, is very beautiful. And the aim of today is just to kind of pick at a couple of verses, a few verses that resonated with me, with the real hope that it will inspire maybe one, if not two, if not all of you, to read this munajat before this month ends. It can be read anytime. It's not reserved for Sha'ban. But I think it, it is very wholesome in this month because it, it humbles us and prepares us for Shahru Ramadan. Uh, the dua begins with salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. We know dua, the salawat is very powerful, right? Our duas, even if, if certain duas don't begin with the salawat, we begin with the salawat because there is a certain charm with beginning with salawat and ending with salawat. The sixth Imam alayhi salam has a tradition in which he says, Man kanat lahu haja ilallah. That one who has any desires that they have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any type of need that they have in front of Allah azza wa jal, fal yabda bis salati ala Muhammadin wali. Begin with the salawat upon the Prophet and his family. Then ask your haja, thumma yakhtim bis salat ala Muhammadin wali. And then end with the salat, right? And he says, why? He says, because the salawat is never rejected by God. He will always accept that dua. And he continues that God is way too kind to accept the first and the last and ignore what's in the middle. Yeah? So have your hajat. Very beautiful, right? Um, it's like an ice cream cake. Who's only going to eat like the, you know, like the end and end? You'll eat the ice cream in between. Likewise, with God, he'll take that middle and accept it. Now remember... Like the goal, of course, is acceptance of dua, right? Acceptance of hajat. But dua itself is very powerful. Just two weeks ago, we talked about what our fourth Imam as Sajjad, alayhi afdalu salatu was salam. <laughs> Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. What he says about dua, he says that whenever you ask God, one of three things happen, if just as a refresher. He said, one, that, that, that request is saved for you. That means you don't have the capacity for it now. It may not be good for you now, but it will be saved for you. Number two, it will be answered for you. Or number three, he says, it will, instead of what you're asking for, your request will save you from some type of tribulation. Some type of bala, your request will save you. So the dua is always heard. Let's not just be waiting for it to be answered for us to feel closer to God. But this is an etiquette. So this dua begins with salawat. And then the Imam alayhi salam begins after that. He says, Wasma' du'a'i idha da'utuk. Listen to my du'a when I call you. Wasma' nida'i idha na'daytuk. And listen to my nida, and listen to my plea when I reach out to you. Waqbil alayya idha na'jaytuk. And attend to me, bring me close to you when I do najwa, when I whisper to you. There are three states that the Imam is describing right off the beginning. The first, the three states are one can either be far from God and call out to him, do a nida. Yeah, if somebody is far, we say, Ya Fulan, right? We're calling out. 
that other state is where one there is there is a closeness there is a bond that exists and so I supplicate I call out there's a dua and then there is a third state where we are very close and I do a najwa yeah where I whisper to you these three states are where a human being can be in at any given time there are times when we feel very close to God so do a najwa at that time yeah do a munajat at that time there are times when I'm connected but maybe not as strong as I feel His presence, then we do a dua to God. Sometimes when I feel like, you know what, I just don't feel it at this moment. Do a, du- do a nida, call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's important to remember is that these three states of a human being are the states that are related to them. This is not how God is. It's not that God is at moments far away from us or God is at moments close to us or very near to us. No, this is our heart. Our hearts sometimes are very connected, sometimes our hearts are not. God is always there. And depending on the level of connection that I want with God, that's the kind of connection God will have with me. I think a mistake that that is often made, and it's a, I can understand why this mistake happens, is that our, our, Distance or our lack of connection at moments is sometimes blamed at God. Like we think that, you know what, okay, I've sinned and therefore God is angry with me. And so God is not answering my dua, right? I can't tell you the number of conversations, the number of emails. I'm pretty sure I shared it here. I don't know. Because I know when you recite so many lectures, you don't know where you said what. You know, that's a big problem. But how many emails or phone calls I've had of people, for example, who don't feel like praying, people who sin, people who can't break habits, and they think that it's because God has turned His back on them. It's not. Not at all, right? God never turns His back on us. God never walks away from us. It's our own connection that we have not developed or strengthened that is causing this to happen. We have a way of of looking at positivity as though God likes us and negativity as though God doesn't like us. It's very natural to think that because that's how our relationships with people are, right? Like if you're nice to me and I'm nice to you, it means I like you. But if, you know, we we have a cold shoulder with each other, maybe that's an indication we don't like you or I don't like you. That's not how God is, right? But we do that, you know. Not too long ago I was playing tennis and I was playing not so well that day, yeah? And so I said, you know, naturally the mind went and said, well, you did pray Fajr, you did do Wudu, you, so Allah, what's going on? Like, as if God is to blame for my lack of playing well that day, right? And this is the mentality. Car doesn't start, we think Allah doesn't like me. I didn't get the job, I think Allah doesn't like me. I didn't do this, I think Allah is mad. No, don't look at these things of... of of whether or not this is a sign of how God considers you or how God looks at you. God looks at you the same way you look at God. But He is even more merciful than that. If I desire to be with God, God desires to be with me. This is why this Shahru Ramadan, inshallah we'll do a welcome to Shahru Ramadan lecture next month, but in Shahru Ramadan, you know, the idea of the Yafatillah is so important the, the the banquet of god is so important that as the host of that banquet naturally god longs to see us he's he's desiring to be as any host who invites someone is excited we have to match that excitement we need to look forward to shahr ramadan not come in there like ah it's here right because if that's how we desire to meet god then that's how god will deal with us but if we come With excitement, God will come with excitement. And God is greater than that. Sometimes there could be where I don't feel it, but God will still persist because He wants something from me at that moment. So these three states that we're in, and it depends on where we are, what we are doing, what our environment is like, that will either make me sometimes call out to Him, sometimes reach out to Him, or sometimes whisper to Him. And it's something that we have to try to figure out what's causing these different states but at the same time what that tells us is that no matter what we are going through yeah no matter what we are going through if i feel distant from god i just don't feel like praying call out to god yeah 
If I feel like it, call out to God. No matter what, don't lose your connection to God. The Imam describes this very beautifully. If you have to call out to Him, call out to Him. If you have to whisper to Him, whisper to Him. But no matter what you do, don't lose your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a very important lesson we take from this dua. The next thing the dua teaches me and inshallah teaches us is that when we do reach out to God, there has to be a neediness in our reaching out. The Imam says, فَقَدْ هَرَبْتُ إِلَيْكَ وَوَقَفْتُ بَيْنَ يَدَيْكَ مُسْتَكِينًا لَكَ He says that, Oh Allah, I am fleeing to you. I am rushing to you. Yeah? Standing before you with full submission, showing submission to you. There has to be a need. We have to experience true neediness when we call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This neediness is something that has to be learned. Yeah? Because in life, neediness is considered a sign of weakness. And that, that, that bamboozles us, I think. That tricks us into thinking that we are truly not that needy. I am self-sufficient. I don't need help carrying this. I don't need help buying groceries I don't so I think that I'm very self-sufficient and that fake aura of self-sufficiency begins to get displayed in my relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where I call out to him we're good ya Allah thank you I just call to say thank you no that's not our relationship with him I need him I desperately need him right and when we reach out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it has to be with that we has to be with that mindset that I really need you Right? For everything, I really need you. And so the more we develop that, the more we gain that closeness. And maybe that neediness is what takes me from being distant to God to something that is closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then that neediness, whether I accept it or not, the Imam alayhi salam says something very beautiful. He says, وَتَعْلَمُ مَا فِي نَفْسِي But you know what's in my soul. Yeah? I can come to Allah with a fake aura of or an idea not a fake or like I think you know I'm good yeah like and even that like I feel like I'm good because you provided to me so it's not like I'm saying that I'm good because I'm good no I'm good because you provided to me there has to be this notion that I I need you constantly at every moment I need you and so even if I have this understanding where I'm good or even if it's a worse understanding than that to think that like, I'm, like, I don't need anything, right? Like, to Allah. Like, that's not a good place to be where we say, I don't need anything, right? Um, the Imam, Allah knows our hearts. He knows deep down we are needy. It's just that we haven't understood we're needy. But God knows that we're needy, right? وَتَعْلَمُ مَا فِي نَفْسِي وَتَخْبَرُ حَاجَتِي وَتَعْرِفُ ضَمِيرِي You know my needs. You know what my dhamir, um, my essence is like um, I think another lesson we can take from that besides coming to him with that neediness and him knowing our neediness so, but more as importantly man don't pretend with God when you ask him don't ever pretend you know like I pretend with you you pretend with me right in the sense that like we see each other the way we see each other we don't know the the difficulties the joys that we have inside our hearts we see each other alhamdulillah we pray for each other but with god there is no need to hide anything so when we ask from him let's not hide anything right confess beg uh, whatever it is that we need to do we we can't fool god he knows exactly what we need and so the most beautiful conversations with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the are the honest conversations with God the truthful conversations with God you know um, where we are able to confess our shortcomings our weaknesses like Allah I get I, I worry all the time yeah and, and I don't like that I'm anxious all the time I I need to, uh, you know, like whatever, I don't know, right? But like, the point is that we don't come into our conversations with God pretending, pretending that, that we, are, we are okay or to pretending other things. We may be okay, but come in there with some honesty, some authenticity. Um, and I think that that type of connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very powerful, right? 
Um, and so that's another point that this dua teaches us. So again, we've covered quite a few points already, but these are just some things that come to my mind. I am sure if you read this munajat, other things will come to your mind. Another passage, these are some passages that, very, that really resonated with me. And the Imam said, Ilahi, Lam yazal birruka ala ayyami hayati, fala takta'a birraka anni fi mamati. That, O oh Allah, you have not stopped being kind to me or showering me with your favors throughout my life. Yeah, you have not stopped. So please do not stop showering your favors upon me during my death. Yeah? Very beautiful. Okay. Um, you know, like the favors of God are all around us, right? Sometimes we only remember those favors that that our tongues ask for, right? So like things that we list off to God. But if you think about the number of things that we don't ask for, yet He provides for us, man, it's a miracle. It's an absolute miracle, right? Like when's the last time we're like, Ya Allah, get, let my heart beat. Yeah, you know, let Ya Allah, let my fingers pick up stuff. Ya Allah, let my lungs take in oxygen. We never even think about these things. Right? But our body is making dua to God, God is answering. Right? Our mind sometimes is making this dua to God and God is answering. The favors of God are constant, are constant, right? And this is why Allah says that if you were to enumerate them, La tuhsuha, you would not be able to count them, right? The favors of God. But as much as we need the favors of God here, man, we need him in the hereafter. Yeah? We need him in the hereafter. Because the success, our success in the hereafter is fully dependent on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't care what kind of person we are in this world, we are far from perfect. Yeah? Um, and so the success, right, like it, it's fully dependent upon this mercy of God, the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and so we have to, we have to in, in, incorporate that as part of our dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, I always feel that there is a physical maturity that we go through in life, right? And as we physically mature, our things that we ask from God change, right? So I know that when I was a kid, it'd be like, Yalla, I want that Nintendo game. Yalla, I want this, I want that. And as I got older, like I needed a car, so like Allah, I need a car. Ya Allah, I need this. Ya Allah, I need um, you know like mortgage paid off, whatever, right? And then when you spiritually mature, you then begin to ask for the akhira stuff, yeah? and that's where I hope that we can like curve to, right? Like we can go towards. Where now like we've reached this age where like man, I'm about to go anytime, right? And so Ya Allah. I hope my death is not difficult. Ya Allah, I hope that Munkar and Nakir take it easy on me. Ya Allah, I need your favors. These are part of the du'as we make because that's the real life, right? And so we have to learn to incorporate that and we need the favors of God. So we are grateful. And so the, one of the ways that we learn that we will inshallah be encompassed in the favors of God is if we are appreciative of the favors of God in this world. Right? So the more we appreciate what God does for us here, inshallah, that will translate to uh, for us there. Um, and then he says, Ilahi qad, again, like I, I'm jumping all over in this munajat. He says, Ilahi qad satarta alayya dhunuban fid dunya wa ana ahwaju ila satriha alayya minka fil ukhra. Ya Allah, you concealed my sins in this worldly life, but I am more in need of concealment in the hereafter. Right? Because in the hereafter, like here, it's, it's a miracle, it's a, it's a blessing of Allah that we don't know each other well enough. You know, We know each other, but like we don't know inside, we don't know. And I've quoted this hadith all the time because I think it's just lovely. The first Imam says, right? إِذَا كَشَفْتُمْ مَا دَفَنْتُمْ that if you are revealed, no one would bury you. Yeah? And if your true nature was known to people, right? that nobody would even attend your funeral because we're struggle, we, are, we are people who struggle internally. Right? But God hides all that. So beautiful that He hides all that. But in the hereafter, we are going to be questioned in front of everyone. Yeah? 
our sins are going to be known to the angels, they're going to be known to the Prophet, and though they know them here, but they're going to be known by everyone. And so, like, we are in need of this satr in the hereafter. Yeah, We are in need of this covering, because we don't want to be embarrassed. Like, imagine, like, even if, I let's say, I end up in Jannah, inshallah, right? But you were behind me in line, and you'd be like, man, you did all that? Right? And I so said, I got to meet you in Jannah knowing you know I know all that. Like, no, man, we have to hide that, right? Because there's a certain level of embarrassment that is there. This is why Allah hides it in dunya. And so we need that. And so the Imam, very beautifully, he asks for that. And of course, there is a responsibility that we have. That if we want our, our sins to be hidden, man, we have to hide our sins in this world. Right? Like we can't be all bombastic about yes, this is who I am, this is a no, hide your sins, right? Like there was a time when we used to hide our sins. Now we like post our sins. Right? Like we post all these things. And not only do I have to hide my sins, man, but I hide the sins of others. Right? Someone may make a mistake. I hide it. I don't go and share it, tell people about it, and this is part of the responsibility. So if I can learn to practice that here, I will practice that. I will get that there. Um, we can go on, but I'll end with my favorite line in this dua, where he says, Ilahi, Ilahi, in akhadtani bi jurmi akhadtuka bi afwik. That if you were to punish me for my offenses, I will fall back on your pardon. Yeah, that means I will say, Ya Allah, I, I, I expect your pardon. Right? That if you are going to hold me accountable, I'm going to hold your pardon accountable, basically. Right? That means that's how much trust the Imam says I have in you. That if you were to take me to account and hold me account for my sins, I will hold on to your maghfira, your, your pardoning and forgiving. And then he says this line, it's, it's, it's just gorgeous, this line. Yeah, he says, "Wa in adkhaltan in nar," that if you were to enter me into the hellfire, "Aalam tu ahlaha anni uhibbuka." Subhanallah. He said that if you were to put me in the fire of hell, I would tell everyone in hell how much I love you, O oh Allah. Yeah? Subhanallah. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. That means you know the people in hell don't love God. Yeah, <laughs> they're mad at God. But he's saying that look. I have this love for you. And, and based on that, I expect your pardon. And based on that, I expect your maghfira. And I expect you not to enter me. Now obviously, that requires action. right? Like don't think that we'll be one of these people who'll be like, I love you on the day of judgment. And God will be like, all right, come on then. right? No, like that, those words won't even cross my mind if they don't exist in my mind here. right? And if I truly love God here, then my actions would be in line with that love. They would never contradict that love. And But if I have that, then I will let the world know how much I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a beautiful munajat. I, I tell you, if you read it with like pausing and reflection, it will take you no more than 20 minutes. But if you just read it straight through, it will take you 10 minutes to 12 minutes. right? But read it with pausing. Maybe even split it in two days. But, but try to be in a place in your heart where there are, there's nothing but God at that moment. And please do so. It is something that I think can be very powerful um, and can have a tremendous effect and an impact in our lives. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammadin. Ma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. We end with a few words of musibah. In remembrance of those who were able to find the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know, naturally we think about a true inspiration such as Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. You know, we can't think that we will be as lucky as Hur to find Allah in the last moments. To find the Imams in the last moments. Hur had something that allowed him to reach that. But whatever it is that he had, he was fortunate that on the day of Ashura, that when the drums of war were beginning, and Hur looks at Umar ibn Sa'd and says, do you really intend on fighting Hussein? 
He says, Ay Wallah, I plan on attacking and beheading Hussein. It is at this time that Khur began to ride his horse towards Aba Abdullah. One of the companions of Hur said, Oh Hur, do you really intend on fighting Hussein alone? But Hur says, I see myself between heaven and hell. And by God, I will not select hell for anyone. Hur rides his horse towards Aba Abdullah. We say, Salam to you, O Hur. That you had that recognition that there was a heaven and hell. And that if you stood in that, in that camp of Umar ibn Sa'id, your destination would be hell. He rides towards Aba Abdullah. <laughs> He comes off of his horse and he says to Imam alayhi salam that do you think Allah will forgive me? <coughs> do you think that Allah will forgive me? Do you think that your mother Fatima will forgive me? <coughs> Imam alayhi salam embraces Hur and says you are truly how your mother had named you. You are free Hur in this world and in the hereafter. فَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيَّ مُنْقَلَبِ يَنْقَلِبُونَ وَالْآقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he hasten the return of our imam that he forgive the sins of our parents and loved ones that for those who are going through difficulty that he end their difficulty for those that have asked us to pray for them, Ya Allah, accept their hajat. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samiyul alim. Wa tub alayna inna ka anta tawabur rahim. Rahim Allahu man kara'a suratil mubarakatil fatiha. Masbukatan bis salati ala muhammadin wa ali muhammad.